Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is George Pulacci, and my co-chairman is uh, Carl Brown. It's the second day of the symposium. We have very interesting papers, and uh, I would like to start with the keynote speaker of today, Professor Michael Free, who will be talking about electrometallurgy innovations. Uh, Michael Free is a professor of metallurgical engineering at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. He has performed research and taught courses as a faculty member since 1996. His areas of expertise include hydrometallurgy, electrometallurgy, corrosion, and material synthesis. He has been the principal investigator of 56 research projects funded by 16 companies, the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, Office of Naval Research, and the National Science Foundation. He has authored or co-authored more than 165 publications, including a hydrometallurgy textbook. He has consulted for 37 organizations. He received a BS degree in metallurgical engineering, an MS degree in chemical engineering, and a PhD degree in metallurgical engineering from the University of Utah. He worked as a postdoctoral associate at the University of Florida in the Department of Material Science and Engineering and Chemical Engineering for two years be before becoming a faculty member at the University of Utah. Please welcome with me, Professor Michael Free. All right. Well, I'm glad to be here. And uh, I wanted to take just a moment, too, to give you a little context for this meeting. So um, I attended uh, an electrometallurgy symposium that was held in Toronto in 2001. And uh, it was a really great meeting. And, and I could see that there was sort of a void in this area uh, a while back. And so I, I kind of led uh, some people, brought some people together uh, to hold this in 2012 and, and set this up through TMS. Uh, as a joint venture with CIM. And uh, we had a great meeting in, in Orlando in 2012. And then um, I wanted to thank George for really picking that up and, and taking that forward to what we have today. And, and I think that uh, we owe George a little uh, thanks for all of his work. There's been a committee that's helped him. Uh, but George has really done the bulk of the work to put this together. So I hope we can take just a moment and thank George for his work. All right, well, I wanted to talk a little bit about some innovative things that uh, uh, really comes out of uh, uh, some work that we did uh, actually four years ago to kind of pull together some of the technologies that were out there uh, to look at some things and then look at the future. What's the future going to look like and what are some things that are innovative? And a lot of that, of course, ties with uh, energy and cost. Um, and so I want to acknowledge all those that really have helped put together various parts of the presentation that I'll be showing you. Uh, Mike Motes, who's here, uh, Tim Robinson, he's probably around, Neil Neil Megum, uh, George Hulachi, David Krieber, George Hollywell, Wei Shi Zhang, uh, Shiji Wang, Ravindra Bide, Abhijit Shukla, uh, Prashant Saraswat, and Rohan Alkokar, um, as well as some organizations who've provided some information that I'll show you. So uh, when we look at electrometallurgy and we look at the context today, we have a lot of different areas that, that are, of course, on the major side of things. Uh, we have magnesium and aluminum as being some major high temperature molten salt based technologies for electro winning. Uh, we have in the aqueous systems, we have copper, nickel, zinc, and then we have some uh, areas where we, we use electrochemistry uh, to get metals, but they're done on a more small scale. Uh, metals such as sodium, lithium, calcium, beryllium, cerium, and, and some others. And then on the aqueous side, we do a fair amount of processing, but on a small scale for gold, silver, gallium, manganese, cobalt, tellurium, and there are others as well. So there's a lot of broad applications for electrometallurgy in a lot of industries when we talk about metal production. And 
in, in terms of some of the future opportunities, uh, I, there are as many possibilities as we uh, could imagine in terms of uh, almost an infinite possible range of things we can do for metals and alloy systems. Um, I, I think some of the ones that are more likely to become more prevalent in the future include titanium, uh, lead, tantalum, uranium, and, and then there's some minor ones that are, we could go on in a big list and it wouldn't really be too helpful. But the, the idea behind some of these innovations, why do we innovate? Well, a lot of the innovations are driven by the challenges that we face. So if we look at the, the challenges that we face in the electrometallurgy area, um, there are some basics that we can look at. Um, there's chemistry, there's quality, environmental issues that all kind of tie together. Of course, uh, energy consumption is big, and we've heard about that uh, this morning in terms of addressing that, and that's obviously on the minds of a lot of corporations uh, and agencies. Uh, we've got safety that's always going to be there, um, and we've got to do more innovative things to make things safer, and there's also productivity issues. So these, these challenges that are out there, I don't see these challenges going away over the next few decades. I think they're always going to be there. So looking at some of these issues and how do we face those challenges and come up with new innovations is really key to the future. So if we look at the chemistry side of things that ties into quality and environmental issues, uh, really we're constrained. Uh, the chemistry is there, there are certain properties of elements, and there are conditions under which reactions go and conditions that they won't go. And the uh, other things that will tie into this that become important are the impurities. Impurities are going to affect the reactions, they're going to affect products, they're going to affect downstream processing. Um, and then we, we also, there's always the counter reaction to whatever we're trying to do. There's a, an effect, a cause and effect issue in chemistry that we have to grapple with that becomes, in, in some cases, limiting to new processes. And then there are other things that we can look at um, that have influences, what electrolytes we're using, uh, the byproducts that can come out, can we process in a different way so that we can produce something as a sellable byproduct rather than have a waste. So there's a lot of opportunities there and innovations of course are going to drive um, the future in terms of what we are able to do with some of those chemistry and environmental issues. The energy side a lot of what we're looking at in terms of new innovations ties in with saving energy. And especially in electrometallurgy where we're using electricity. And none of the processes yet that I've seen are 100% efficient. Um, let me know if I'm, I'm wrong on that, but uh, nothing commercial that I've seen is quite there yet, but we're getting close in some areas and we keep driving closer. And of course, that, that ties into some of the things that we do. And then the cost of energy is also a big factor. In some cases, that drives what uh, particular process we go towards because of, in some areas, the costs are much higher for energy than others. And that dictates, in many cases, the economics of choosing one particular technology over another. Um, we've got safety and health issues in the environment. Um, obviously, there's some things that we address um, in terms of the materials handling, some of the things that we uh, work with are toxic. And then in, in the case of the high temperature processing, there's a lot of safety issues that tie into handling things at, at very high temperatures. Um, and, and there are a lot of uh, smaller scale things that we deal with on safety that tie into how we do things and the way we uh, manage products and, and how we harvest and do other things. Um, another aspect of this is looking at minimizing exposure of employees to these kinds of toxic entities or um, these hazards that might be present. Um, and we look at ways that we can um, implement safe practices that provide additional protection for employees and just preventing accidents. And uh, you're probably aware of a lot of things that have happened over the years in terms of these safety issues that um, have driven changes in companies. And um, we have to keep looking at that and finding ways to manage things and become better. Productivity is another one that is driving some of the changes that we'll talk about. Uh, we want to become more productive. How do we do that? Well, um, automation keeps coming more and more into the forefront in some areas. And how do we make it more automated? How do we mechanize things? 
Um, and that uh, drives things like some of the robotics use. It also is tied in with safety. The more we can automate things and have people less exposed, the, the safer some of these operations can become. Um, and the other aspect of this is uh, looking at the throughput, increased capacities and uh, allowing things to happen at a higher rate. And then, of course, we see larger scale productions. Uh, there's a general driving force to go larger and larger for the economy of scale. Um, but there's also technologies where we can fit smaller um, units in different places where uh, maybe we couldn't before um, automate things and make things work even on a smaller scale. But generally, there's a driving force to go, of course, large. And I'll show you some information and some data for that. Um, let's talk about aluminum. With aluminum, uh, it's a big industry, as we know, in terms of the electrometallurgy side of things. Um, that's really the... Uh, the gorilla in the room, so to speak, that it's, it's huge. There's an enormous amount of electricity there, an enormous potential to save uh, large amounts of energy by um, increasing efficiencies there. And uh, we, of course, know about the basic processes of bare process and the hall hurl process. And then what is interesting with uh, the aluminum industry is that making better cells, of course, uh, can help in addressing the energy side of things and, and the safety things as well. Uh, there are a couple main technologies that tend to be out there, the Soderberg cell and the pre-bake cell. Uh, they're, uh, they're quite prevalent. I'll show you some schematics. They're a little bit small here to really see the details for, but, but the idea is how, how can you make these cells more efficient? How can you make them uh, larger in many cases? and uh, make them more automated and increase the current density. So there's a lot of work being done in the aluminum industry to try to um, enhance the uh, opportunities to save energy. And um, if we look at some of the cells and, and we look at the size, this is kind of a, a nice indicator of the growth in terms of this efficiency aspect of aluminum processing. This shows these different cells over time in terms of the size um, based on a current um, in kiloamps. And, and looking at over time um, as aluminum production has happened, you can see uh, that, that the growth has been relatively steady for a long time. It's, it's maybe tapered off in some of these technologies. But as we look, um, really there's a, a big driver to, to keep pushing these currents and, and the size of the cells to larger and larger scales. And I, I don't see any sign that this is likely to change um, over the future. And, and maybe there's some of you out there that work in the aluminum, aluminum industry. There are some pauses where we really haven't seen maybe much development in terms of the size. We come to a certain size cell and we stick with it for a while. But eventually, someone comes up with some new changes, and, and we see an uptick in terms of the size of these units. Uh, that's happened in lots of different industries, of course, and, and the electrometallurgy side of things is, is no exception to that um, for at least the aluminum industry. And uh, there's been you know, a, a driver out there in terms of making the size uh, better. Um, and, and in fact, the, the productivity in terms of the amount of aluminum that's produced per meter squared per year has remained relatively constant. Uh, there's new technologies that people are working on with uh, alternative anode systems and designs on anodes to get higher current densities. Um, but, um, you know, it'll probably continue to push up a little bit in terms of the actual production per unit area, um, but a lot of the main increases have been in the cell sizes as far as the aluminum production goes. Um, and, and in terms of some other possibilities, uh, there are uh, some new technologies that people are working with. Some of you are familiar with those in terms of oxygen emission um, using inert anodes, um, molten um, salts or molten oxide materials, uh, allowing that type of reaction to go on. And, and how far it will go is, is a little bit early to tell. Um, but we've got such a big industry using the, the current system that it's going to take some time for any of these new technologies to 
to change dramatically what's being done. So most of the work is um, in s sort of smaller scale things. These are more larger scale type changes um, with different systems and looking at different types of electrodes and, and even potentially looking at carbothermic reduction as a way to, to do the production on large scale. Um, but the main drivers that we see that are being implemented are really these incremental improvements in the industry. In terms of copper electro refining, uh, there's uh, a, a need out there in the industry to produce high grade copper from the smelter uh, production. And of course, the electro refining is the, the workhorse of that. Um, and, and it's a fairly low voltage process, a low energy process. Um, and so most of the innovations there, there's not a huge amount of energy to be saved because they don't use huge amounts of energy like the aluminum industry does. Uh, so, but it is a, it's a, it's a big business out there and there are some incremental things that have been done. Um, it's been around for a long time. Uh, but what's also kind of interesting, there's implementation of technologies um, gradually in most cases um, and things like permanent cathodes have become uh, very prevalent, some automated stripping. Um, some of that got started in the 70s. It's quite prevalent today. Uh, we see some work in, in the automation area with cranes and, and robotic handling becoming a little bit more common with time. Um, some better systems for contacts. Um, polymer concrete cells are pretty, pretty common these days. Um, and uh, we have other um, technologies that are used in terms of monitoring. And we've got some new, new flow cells that are out there uh, MedTop BRX being one of those that I'll show you a picture of in a moment. Um, and there's some other things that are out there innovation-wise to do monitoring um, and in improvements in systems for uh, controlling weights and other things that will help a little bit with efficiency. But there's not a huge amount of gain really possible in terms of energy with that, that uh, technology in, in electro-refining because there's not much to start with. Uh, this shows a cell for MedTop. Um, what's, what's interesting is that it represents a little bit of a change in terms of the uh, way the flows are coming into the cell. Uh, there's some improvements that can be gained in terms of going to higher current, current densities and uh, maintaining uh, high quality cathodes. Um, and I think one thing that's, that's likely to be a part of this in the future, there's a lot of work out there that's been done in modeling um, and it's getting better and better. Um, this shows two different potential cell designs here, flow from the top um, and out the bottom. Normal conventional cells have flow from the bottom and out the top. I think that there's some possibilities there. Uh, the MET top has a little different configuration than either of these. Uh, but I think what's important here is that, that there's some capability to model and design cells to have better flow, to get um, really good uh, product out as well as uh, to make it slightly more efficient. And um, I think that the nice thing here is that I think this modeling can play a role in trying configurations without having to do all of it in the plant because it's, it's pretty high fidelity. There's been a lot of good validation work that's been done out there to show that it works pretty well. In terms of copper electro winning, uh, we have a little bit more energy to, to work with in terms of saving. Um, it's not used nearly as much as the electro refining in, in terms of copper, uh, but there, uh, there's certainly a need to look at uh, new technologies for copper electro winning to improve things. And uh, if we look at some of the, the technologies that relate to this, um, there's really the, the use of these permanent cathodes has been helpful there. Um, and, and again, we talked a little bit about flow. I think you see there's a few places that have done some uh, modified flow scenarios to get better mass transport in the cells. I don't know how far that will go uh, because you have reasonable transport with uh, bubbles that are generated at the anodes. Um, but I think there's some opportunities there. I think there's definitely some opportunities there in terms of safety issues, um, dealing with things uh, like acid mist and using ventilation and cell hoods to uh, mitigate those issues. And I think there's also some nice opportunities out there in terms of energy savings, um, using alternative uh, anodes out there and, and the coated titanium ones are, are the main candidate that's making a little bit of an inroad into the industry to um, lower the power costs there. And particularly in areas where the power costs are extremely high, that becomes um, advantageous. There's a, 
a picture of one, and I know there's different vendors and different systems out there, but this is just an example of that. Um, and, and if we look at these tank houses, um, they're, they're so large that they're, and there's some, some nice opportunities there, maybe even in the, um, the way that things are aligned to, to make sure that you get the efficiencies that are available. And in terms of some of the future things, I, I, as I've mentioned, I think the flow control, there's some issues there that are likely to uh, work better. And th there's work that's going on, as we've mentioned, with uh, the coated titanium anodes. And I think another area that's of interest is in the larger electrodes. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly where that will go, and, and that's something that uh, there have been some plants that have gone to um, some larger electrodes. and. Uh, we'll see where that ends up in terms of the long term, um, but I think there's some opportunities there. And there's also some interesting opportunities in terms of process control and, and looking at uh, ways to control the positions of the electrodes and some other things that will help a little bit with efficiencies. Uh, there's also some possibilities out there. These are more long term. Uh, maybe we're looking 20 or 30 years, but the opportunity is really amazing in terms of what can be done with saving the energy that's there with electrowinning by converting over to uh, a CU plus one, uh, one electron transfer system instead of the conventional two electron, saving half the energy. Um, and also in combination with that, changing from our typical water hydrolysis, which is um, actually a big consumer of the energy in uh, copper electrowinning today, um, and converting that to a, a system that is based on a lower energy uh, reaction, the ferrous-ferric couple, um, and also the cuprous cupric couple. And um, w when that's combined, now there is a problem with uh, parasitic reactions, and so there has to be some things that are done with flow or potentially with diaphragms to make sure that you don't have too much of that crossover. Uh, but I think you can manage it pretty well and actually couple it in with leaching uh, by providing an oxidant for leaching while simultaneously providing the reduction for the copper reaction. And then, of course, um, if we do that kind of a leaching scenario, we have to deal with some of the um, other entities, the buildup of iron, and there's some reactions out there that people have investigated to handle that. Uh, magnesium is an interesting area that um, today, most of the production's coming out of the pigeon process. Uh, there is quite a bit of production out from uh, the electrolytic side, and it, it, of course, had its origin a long time back, uh, as early as the 1800s. And there have been some facilities that have been using seawater um, to do some of the processing, uh, and uh, sometimes in, in, in the case of some places, they've done some uh, calcine dolomite to produce magnesium chloride feed. Uh, most of the electrowinning is done with the magnesium chloride systems, and they use anhydrous magnesium chloride, which is actually a little bit tricky uh, to make and to uh, not have interfering magnesium oxide uh, that uh, reduces the current efficiency, the conductivity of the electrolyte. Um, it causes problems um, in terms of sludge and other things. Um, and that's actually something that's been, uh, I think, a nice innovation that's allowed for some improvements in some of the technology there with magnesium. Uh, this is just some general information that uh, is out there for some of the older cells um, uh, and some more modern cells. And then uh, today, U.S. Magnesium um, is doing some really nice things. Uh, they are able to get the chlorine strength coming out of the uh, anode side of the cell to above 96 percent that opens up markets for them and um, this is also important they've made some innovations to where they're cut recovering a, a lot more of the chlorine than they were uh, there were some environmental issues uh, US magnesium's operation was actually um, listed as one of the worst polluters around um, in some of the older technology because of chlorine emissions and uh, they've been able to uh, reduce that uh, a lot and become more efficient. And you'll notice the energy savings from some of the older technologies to some of the newer technologies. And some of that is really tied to how they make their magnesium chloride and how they make it pure. Um, they go through some fairly innovative processing to get rid of the very last remnants of magnesium oxide 
and uh, to make sure that that uh, mag chloride is, is anhydrous. Um, if you've worked with magnesium chloride or if you've worked with magnesium itself, you know, it, it oxidizes very, very readily. And in fact, uh, we can use it to take away oxygen from titanium, with, which really likes oxygen. Uh, magnesium really, really likes oxygen. And so it's actually quite tricky to do this and to make it work and to become efficient. So they've made some nice inroads. Um, you know, how much more they can do in some cases on the efficiency side, I'm not sure they're really going to do a lot. Uh, but they are looking at doing expansions and things and, and tweaking what they already have. Uh, the other thing that may be worth noting here on magnesium, uh, there's some new technology using uh, uh, molten oxides that uh, are, I think, at least something to, to consider for the future as far as an alternative for making magnesium. Um, and there's some different electrolytes that people have looked at to um, help to facilitate that. And uh, we'll see where that goes. It's a little bit early in the technology stage to, to really predict exactly where that will end up. Um, but there's certainly some encouraging possibilities there. Um, Nickel-wise, there are uh, some nice opportunities there um, in terms of uh, improving efficiencies. And uh, there have been some innovations that have been made both on the chlorine-based systems and the sulfate-based systems. And uh, there are some new things out there in terms of looking at um, hoods and, and cell skirts that, uh, as well as some holes in cathodes to help uh, nickel deposits hang on uh, for the right amount of time and not be too hard to remove after, but to facilitate hanging on long enough to be harvested. I think with titanium, uh, you know, titanium work's been out there for a long time, and we don't see any, I'm not aware of any commercial titanium electro-winning plants out there. Uh, but the possibilities are, are tantalizing, I think. Um, but as we know, um, one of the challenges is titanium loves oxygen so much that uh, some of the work that I have seen so far coming out of the um, titanium electro-winning side and that includes these uh, uh, some technologies that I'll show you. Uh, most of that work that I have seen the data from uh, doesn't quite meet oxygen standards for the regular titanium grades that are sold today. Um, typically, most of the technologies that have done the electro winning, I have not seen them typically come out of the cells much better than 1% or so oxygen, having it lower than that. Um, so, but what I see there is some possibilities. I'm not sure how much they'll be able to end up doing on the commercial scale to getting oxygen out at a level that will allow it to be sold immediately in the market. But I think that what you may see is sort of an adaptation where they do a post-processing, um, a deoxygenation uh, step. Um, there's some new technology out there. One of the standard technologies is to take calcium, to treat it at a high temperature, to pull out the remnant of oxygen that's there with the titanium. Um, there's some new technology that's out there that will allow you to use a combination of magnesium and hydrogen to do the same thing um, to the same levels that will meet um, ASTM grade specs for um, CP titanium. I think you'll see that potentially some of these technologies could be coupled with some auxiliary technologies to make that viable. Um, I think part of the issue too with titanium uh, is that you have uh, the, a, a challenge with uh, multiple valence states. So I'll show you an example of what I mean by that in a minute. Um, but titanium can be very often found in a plus two, plus three, and plus four state, states when it's been oxidized. And so that creates a little bit of a challenge when we're doing electro winning because if you have several different species in there at different oxidation states, um, there, you can have uh, redox couples where um, you get some, some of it going to one state, then it goes back over to the other electrode and gets um, reoxidized or uh, partially oxidized or partially reduced, and it floats back into the other electrode and it sort of goes back as a parasitic redox shuttle. That creates problems. Um, and then uh, the other side of this is that um, there's also some challenges in terms of dealing with uh, the, the chemistries, the high temperatures involved and such that I think uh, are a little bit problematic 
in terms of uh, the electro winning side of things. There's some work out there that's being done with molten uh, titanium in electrolysis cells. Um, that's that's a bit uh, uh, of, a, of a challenge in terms of um, the materials and handling and things like that at the higher temperatures that are needed to do molten titanium processing. So just a couple of things that uh, are out there in terms of technologies uh, are uh, direct reduction of oxides uh, in the solid state. There's been quite a bit of work that's that's been done there, that's being done there, um, and that uh, again that in the solid state when that's happened, there's also molten state work. Uh, but um, again, one of the big challenges is that it, it isn't. So far, I haven't seen them reduce it to the level of oxygen that's needed for the main market, so they have to go into post-processing to make it happen. Uh, but that's, that's, I think, a viable thing to do. Uh, other work's been done uh, with uh, titanium tetrachloride reduction uh, in diaphragm cells. I'll show you a little slide of that. And then there's also some work with titanium oxycarbide. Um, you'll see a presentation that follows <coughs> mine uh, on that, so I won't go into any details, but there's some interesting work that's being done with that. Um, and then this liquid metal oxide work uh, to produce oxygen gas is also um, very interesting and, and uh, in terms of uh, the product coming out of oxygen and liquid metal, it's quite, quite attractive from an environmental perspective. Uh, this shows a basic schematic of the FFC processes, which is the solid state process of essentially taking um, preforms of uh, material that are in the oxide state and then in, the, in molten salt that's converted to essentially a reduced product that ends up getting processed into uh, a powder and eventually uh, whatever product. Um, this is showing some work that's being done um, on mitigating this redox shuttle. So for example, if we have titanium plus four and titanium plus two and they go back and forth, that short circuits some of the current. And uh, that can be mitigated though by using um, a series of uh, diaphragms to help so that you're essentially cascading from one system to the next in terms of reduction so that you can eliminate some of that redox shuttling. Um, this shows a cutaway cell um, for that um, where, um, and this comes out of uh, Case Western, um, where you um, can essentially deposit inside after you cross through membrane to help mitigate some of that redox shuttling. So, the uh, other things that, that are interesting that are out there um, and in the zinc industry, there's uh, some opportunities there to, of course, reduce energy. There's, there's a, uh, a big potential savings there in terms of what can be done. Um, one of the things that's, that's really critical in the case of the zinc is the trace impurities. And so there's, there's a need for some really efficient purification processes that are uh, necessary to make it work. And if we look at um, some of the developments, of course, there's some issues that we've already talked about in the other systems of um, using mechanical stripping, and, and that's um, shown a very significant uh, reduction in, in labor costs and, and uh, the labor force that's needed in recent times. There's been new cell houses developed and, and, and that have facilitated uh, higher productivity um, there's new sensors and technologies out there to help with the purification side of things. Um, there's new alloys that have been developed, and, and, and that's also true in, in, to some extent in the copper industry uh, to help uh, make the anodes last longer and to uh, improve performance. And uh, there's some interesting things that are out there in terms of purification. This shows a, a fluidized bed purification unit. Uh, that uh, George Hulachi supplied to me um, a while back. And uh, this shows some of the zinc dust. A lot of times we're, we're using zinc dust in plants to help uh, pull out the impurities uh, through a sacrificial reaction to uh, make sure that the solutions meet the right purification standards. Um, and in terms of recycling, um, zinc comes into the recycling loop quite a bit from the steel industry. And so there's a lot of electric arc furnace um, facilities that uh, are producing some of the zinc and that's getting processed. And uh, some of the limitations um, of those kinds of recycling efforts have been mitigated a little bit by some new technology such as Zincx. 
And uh, just in conclusion, I think that it's pretty easy to see when we look at uh, electrometallurgy, there's a lot of basic challenges that we face today that have been faced in the past. We'll face them in the future. And I think that uh, those basic areas of looking at the chemistry, the quality of the products, the environmental issues that are surrounding those, uh, energy consumption, safety, productivity, they're here to stay. And so uh, it's going to be people like you and, and others that will join in the efforts to develop innovations that address these issues and help uh, electrometallurgy to move forward in the future and uh, meet these challenges. So with that, I'll end and, and uh, allow a little bit of time for some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Time. We have time for a few questions. Yeah, Alex? Alex Burns with Morgan Engineering. Um, you mentioned the problem with redox shuttling and things like titanium, and that would apply to uranium and others as well. But you didn't talk about uh, ion exchange membranes and membrane electrolysis. Can you speak a bit to the challenges of introducing membranes to processes like this? Well, I think one of the challenges with adding a membrane or a diaphragm into the system is there's an energy penalty, right? You, you, you have a voltage step across the membrane. Um, you have transport issues, you have handling issues, you have plugging issues. Um, so there's logistical issues as well as a little bit of an energy issue. Uh, and you have to have the right kind of membrane that will withstand the environment, which is also challenging. Um, and in fact, some of the molten salt work that, that this is used in um, that's, that's actually one of the main technologies they're trying to, to perfect and, and improve is the lifetime of these membranes and the viability in terms of uh, not getting unplugged and things like that and how you handle it. So, so I think that there are some challenges to that, uh, but I think that that's something that people are working on, and I think, I think we'll see some of that um, still come into play. Um, but, yeah, you, you pay a little bit of a price. Any other questions? I have a question. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, in terms of the chemistry and quality and the copper industry, um, most of the plant houses are quite large, uh, like 400 or more thousand dollars. And that concept has been growing based on the development of high quality copper coming to the system and producing relatively clean anodes. <coughs> Nowadays we are going towards more complexity where anodes are becoming more complex. How do you see that trend in terms of having large refineries or smaller? Well, I think, I, I mean, in general, there's still going to be a trend towards doing larger processing. And, and of course, <coughs> the anode content is going to have generally in the future more impurity. So that's, that's part of our challenge is dealing with that. And I think, I think there's some good technologies that are being developed um, to handle that, um, some better understanding of anode chemistry and uh, how we deal with the slimes and things like that um, that will be very useful. I, th I think we'll see some improvements in that area. I think it's going to grow big. And, and I think uh, Mike Motz and I, we can maybe talk to you after and um, share some thoughts on that. But there's, there's a lot of, I think, opportunities there. Okay. Mm -hmm. One more question, uh, Mike. Uh, can you comment on this, uh, you know, the harvesting from the copper refining and the copper electro winning, it's quite uh, labor intensive. What do you think of the future in terms of continuous recovery and harvesting of the? Okay, good question. So <laughs> how do we make it continuous? Well, um, I think what you've seen, you know, in, in recent years, you see a lot of this automation with things like automated cranes and there's a lot of automatic systems for um, stripping. I don't know that it's continuous may be a stretch. Yes. I think that that's... Um, probably pretty challenging to actually make it totally continuous, but I think in terms of these batch modes being automated, in that sense, I think we'll see more and more technologies that essentially make it so that it's not so labor intensive. I think we'll see new, con better control systems to know where there are um, shorts, better, better strategies for preventing shorts from happening in the first place. 
Um, and so the, I think gradually we'll see less and less labor needed to produce every unit of metal. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Next presentation uh, by Dr. Rauf Lutfi. Dr. Lutfi got his graduate education in Canada, PhD in physical chemistry from University of Western Ontario, and his MBA from McGill. Dr. Lutfi's first industrial job was in Noranda Research Center in Quebec. Then he moved west to Argo National in Chicago, to Arco, in Tucson, Arizona. Dr. Lutfi co-founded MER, which is an R&D company 30 years ago, developed for development of advanced materials and metal products. Dr. Lutfi has over 300 publications and over 50 patents. I'd like to in invite her. Thank Lutfi. you. Okay, uh, I'm glad to be back in Canada. And, uh, uh, as, as George said, my name is uh, Lutfi. Really, the work I'm going to present today is uh, by Dr. Withers and his team. Uh, I'm more involved in uh, uh, armors and, and, and uh, ballistics. And, uh, but I, um, I'm an electrochemist, so I, hopefully I can uh, do a good job for the work that uh, Jim did. So what I'm going to present to you this morning is uh, the work we've been doing on uh, electrolytic production of titanium, and specifically regarding titanium powder. Okay? And this is one of the advantage of electrolysis, is that you can produce the titanium as a powder to start with. Uh, so here's a profound uh, statement. Uh, the, you know, there is an increased interest in low-cost uh, uh, titanium powder and specifically for powder metallurgy and more important for additive manufacturing. MER has been involved in additive manufacturing for the last 15 years. So we, we use titanium sponge and we use titanium powder. So it was a motivation for us to really produce titanium powder at, at a low cost. And again, the motivation is to, to be able to use the powder in additive manufacturing and make big parts for uh, military application. Uh, and, and uh, the, but the titanium, most of the titanium produced uh, today commercially is uh, from the crow process. To, so to understand how we can uh, reduce the cost of uh, titanium powder, we need to look at the, at the fundamental of the crow process. And this is a schematic, and it's a fairly complex uh, process. This is uh, a titanium, a t 10 ton titanium uh, 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 a billet produced by uh, the core process. You have titanium oxide plus carbon. You chlorinate at high temperature. Uh, you produce the TiCl4, which is a tickle. And then you have to distill it to remove the, uh, the iron chloride impurities and so on. And then you put it in a, in a, reaction, a batch reaction and you uh, add magnesium to reduce the tickle to titanium. And uh, magnesium chloride, and the magnesium chloride is recycled to the magnesium cell. So you can see the law processing step. Uh, this batch reaction uh, takes like two weeks and uh, produce about 10 ton piece that has to be cut, crushed, sieved into different uh, sizes of titanium sponge. This is our uh, uh, porous, uh, irregular shaped titanium so normally, it cannot be easily used for uh, additive manufacturing or for uh, powder metallurgy. Uh, MER developed a process to actually use the, the sponge directly to, uh, into a plasma arc to uh, produce parts. And this is one of the advantages that we, that we developed is uh, because sponge is not as expensive as other alloy titanium. So, uh, to, to, to look at the cost of making powder from the chlor process, you can see almost 50% of the cost is for the ore, uh, the chlorination, uh, the reduction because the magnesium, and then you have to remelt, and you have to go back and alloy 
to produce a titanium alloy. And if you want to produce a, a part, you're going to machine it and produce a part. If you're going to produce powder, you have to atomize it. You have to take now that billet and remelt and, and atomize. So the, the total cost uh, for doing the titanium powder from uh, the chlor process will be in the 60 to 150 dollars a pound. Very expensive to be able to make a rapid prototype part or to make PM part. So really the question is that how do we, uh, uh, I mean one way as I mentioned is that we, we start with a sponge. Okay, and, and we have to develop a, a PM, a, a rapid prototyping technology to allow us to use sponge and at the same time alloy the sponge during the additive manufacturing. And this is things that MER did. Uh, but the focus here is that how do we produce uh, cheap titanium powder? So one way is to do hydro, uh, hydride dehydration and that will break down the titanium and that's done extensively on turning and segregated scrap. And this is the competition really to uh, titanium powder is uh, the scrap recycle and it's a, it's a big market for scrap recycle. You can also do hydride dehydride for the sponge, but then you're not gonna get the alloy. So you have, you, this is gonna be only applied to high purity titanium. There is a, a the, the problem of uh, uh, this powder is that they're very fine. Okay, and for powder, for uh, uh, additive manufacturing, and for PM, you need a slightly coarse powder, 25 micron and so on. So th this is not very good for really uh, the applications. Uh, there are processes, uh, continuous flow tube reaction, where you flow the tickle plus sodium or, or other reductant, and, uh, and, it put, and you can also have the alloy, uh, the, the alloying element involved, but again, this produces very fine uh, powder. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we did a melt uh, uh, stream uh, arc wire process to uh, produce the, the, the titanium. And I'll, I'll mention that if I get a chance. So the, I think the previous speaker mentioned that the, the, there was a lot of effort on uh, electrolysis of tickle. You know, almost half a century, I think uh, since 70, 70 years. And you know, there was indication that it's possible to produce titanium powder from tickle. But a uh, couple of the problem, in addition to the, the, the different oxidation states for titanium is that titanium tetrachloride doesn't dissolve very well in molten salt. So you have very limited solubility because it's equivalently bonded. So you, you're starting already negative in terms of uh, the concentration of titanium in the electrolyte. And uh, uh, above that, it gets reduced to TiCl3, to TiCl2, and then it gets oxidized at the anode because you have chlorine evolution and the chlorine will oxidize the titanium. Worse is that uh, is a fog formation. You, you, when you form TiCl2, or TiCl, sorry, when you form TiCl3 in presence of TiCl4, you get this proportionation reaction and you form titanium fines, it's almost like a mud, which is very difficult to separate from the electrolyte. And uh, so as such, so what, you know, what, what do we do? And really, uh, what we need is uh, one species of titanium in the electrolyte, and that's uh, the TiCl2. If we have a only TiCl2, and uh, second thing is that if you, uh, TiCl2 is ionic and it has very good solubility, it can go up to 10, uh, uh, 10 weight percent solubility in the electrolyte in molten salt. The other thing you have to have is that uh, you have to prevent the oxidation on the anode side. So you have to use an anode that uh, at a potential that will not take Ti. Uh, 2 plus to TI3 or TI4. And uh, so the production of TiCl2 is really enabling to be able to produce titanium with the powder. Uh, so the way the innovation that, that we came up with uh, many years ago is to do this carbothermic reduction step combined by electrolysis. So here we take TiO2 plus carbon and uh, 
high temperature, under control atmosphere and with, with some vacuum, and you produce Ti2OC, titanium oxycarbide, right? And uh, it turned out that titanium oxycarbide is fairly highly conductive. It's almost as conductive as uh, high quality uh, graphite. It's, it, uh, it is uh, the color of uh, iron sulfide. It's a uh, gold color. Uh, and uh, you can make anode very similar to the cathode that uh, Frey process made. You made anode and then you can elect, uh, you make pellets and you can use this as an anode to produce Ti2 plus at the anode side, which then can be reduced at the cathode. Uh, so the, the, with this uh, step, really this is an enabling step to be able to produce titanium electrolytically, is to make the Ti2OC. And, and based on this idea, we got funded and we actually scaled it up uh, to uh, 50 pounds per day uh, electrolysis process. So we had a carbothermic step to produce the Ti2OC. Uh, we had electrolysis, and the, the electrolysis cell has a lot of innovative design to be able to, uh, to, to with pumps, high temperature pumps, to be able to, uh, uh, to push the electrolyte to collect the titanium and, and recycle it in, uh, and harvest the titanium powder, take the titanium powder into the next step, evaporate the salt, and, uh, and, and, uh, and recycle it into the cell. Uh, this uh, pilot plant ran for I don't know how many months, uh, we have a joint venture with Timet, and that plant was disassembled and shipped to Nevada. Uh, this is the, one of the issues is really the size of the, the titanium powder you produce. The bigger the size of the powder, the more applicable to uh, the powder metallurgy or additive manufacturing, plus it's going to have less impurities right, and less oxygen. And as we can produce powder, fairly, fairly sizable, from 20 micron to 50 micron. Again, it depends on the current density, depends on the operating condition of the cell. Okay. Uh, the other thing we did is that we, uh, we demonstrated that uh, we can produce the alloy. The, the alloy, the aluminum and vanadium potentials are very close to the titanium potential. So by control, controlling the activi activity coefficient of this element in the electrolyte, we can produce the, the alloy. And uh, a very important is that we did projected the cost of producing titanium powder electrolytically. And actually, I was involved in that part of costing the, the process. Uh, and it came to be fairly similar, or actually less than the cost of the sponge. So now we have two sources. We can either use our electrolytic powder or we can use the sponge to, to make, uh, to make it, uh, added, added the manufacturing components. Uh, but of course, we prefer to use our own powder. Okay. So the, uh, the, the very interesting thing is about the TIOC that uh, it can be chlorinated at very low temperature, right? Uh, because basically you're oxidizing it. It's already in the in the lower oxidation state, and when you put chlorine, it's an exothermic reaction. So you can produce tickle at very low temperature. Uh, it starts at 180 degrees. At 300 degrees, you, uh, it is a self-sustaining uh, reaction. So it's, it, is a, it is also a way to produce tickle, and the tickle can be used in, uh, in the chlor process to produce sponge, or you can uh, use it for other, other application. Uh, very, very unique material, uh, the, the Ti2OC. Uh, very important is that why do you, you have to chlorinate titanium oxide at such high temperature? And one of the reasons is, uh, is uh, phosgene formation and also uh, 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 chlorinated hydrocarbon. Car when you use any source of carbon for reduction in presence of chlorine, if you're below 800 degrees, you're going to produce mm -hmm. chlorinated hydrocarbon. Okay, no problem. I think I'll make it. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, and I, I worked on alcohol process, uh, alcohol process producing aluminum in the, in the 80s. 
And the biggest problem uh, that shot Alcoa was chlorinated hydrocarbon formation during the formation of aluminum chloride. Okay. And that's what shot the plant uh, in, uh, in Texas. And we had a joint venture with them to how to eliminate chlorinated hydrocarbon. And the only way to, to do it at that time was to go above 800 degrees. And at this temperature, it, the corrosion becomes a real problem. So uh, low temperature chlorination is always uh, favorable, but you have to eliminate the chlorinated hydrocarbon. The fact that the carbon in the Ti2OC is not a, a carbon, it's already went to very high temperature, you do not form chlorinated hydrocarbon. And you can chlorine, it produce the tickle at low temperature. At low temperature. Okay? So in, in conclusion is that uh, uh, we, we showed that uh, Ti2OC, the carbothermic, combining carbothermic reduction plus electrolysis, we can produce titanium powder at, uh, at low cost. We're still uh, continuing the joint venture with Timet, and uh, that's why actually Dr. Weather is not here today. He's, he's meeting with them, and, uh, and we're still getting funding for the third scale up now. So uh, hopefully that will be, uh, it, it, it doesn't guarantee that we're gonna go commercial, but at least we are in the, in the process. Plus we demonstrated that we can produce alloy from the, and uh, we can produce it at the cost. Uh, 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 as I mentioned to you, we have a, a, a plasma arc process that we produce uh, components, and we can actually take uh, metal and uh, uh, go through the, the plasma, and, and if you use a low, low, uh, low temperature electrolyte, uh, you can spheridize it, you can produce uh, spherical uh, titanium. So we can start with the sponge directly and, and go into the, the plasma and produce powder. And uh, this, this is the, the art process. It's a 17 feet tall building uh, with uh, bellows and moving uh, arc to produce parts such as this. This is a Humvee door. Uh, the Humvees, is, uh, the doors are very, very heavy with, uh, with uh, ballistic windows, and when the, when the, when the Humvee uh, 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 roll over, it's very hard for the soldier actually to just lift the door, okay? So they, they were very interested in titanium doors, and we actually made doors with the, already the holes were a part of the, the process, and here is uh, the doors, uh, coated with plastic, and this was actually fielded in Afghanistan. Uh, and with that, really, that's uh, my, my, my talk, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Raul. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Alberto? One quick question. What raw materials did you try? Did you try pure elemental, pure perovskite, Very good question. Right, right. We, we had a program on uh, starting with aluminite, and, and very interestingly is that when you go to this high temperature uh, carbothermic step, the iron becomes uh, iron metal, right, which is easier to separate, plus you can get the tickle and you can, uh, but the, the, our focus was more on using uh, pure titanium oxide, because we're, we had enough problems to try to solve the electrolysis than to worry about the raw material. Any other question? Yes. Dimitri. I know the, the one I showed you was 50 pounds per day, but I really, I, I mean, somebody asked me that before, and I really don't know what, I didn't ask Dr. Withers before I left what was the size, uh, the second scale up, and now they are uh, planning for the third scale up. I'm not sure exactly what the size is. But I can I can find out. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you very much. The third presenter this morning is uh, Jean-Francois Magnat, and he's going to talk to us about the lithium hydroxide production by electrolytic process. Mr. Magna is a professional engineer with over 20 years experience in metallurgical industry. He held several positions with the industry and has many patents in the lithium rechargeable uh, system, 
He has a master's degree in material engineering from Laval University, and he is now the technology director in the Nemaska lithium process. Okay, thank you everybody for attending my presentation. Today I'm, uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, the, the, the key advantage of the Nemaska uh, business plan and uh, process. Um, um, so before, uh, just before that, I have only a few financial data in my presentation, but this is the usual forward-looking statement that I have to show you because I have some financial data in my presentation. So just before talking more in detail about the, the, the Masca uh, uh, electrochemical process, I would like to introduce you briefly the business case from a geographic point of view. Nemaska has discovered what we consider as the second most interesting spodiumine, pegmatite spodiumine deposit in the north of Quebec. It is uh, located uh, about three, it is located 300 kilometers north of Shibugamu City, uh, very close to the Nemaska uh, Creek community. So there is a lot of infrastructure there. There's an airport, there is a, already a camp, there is already sub electric sub-power uh, station, and um, a lot of, of, of workers will come from the Creek community of Nemaska. We have started the training and so on. Uh, so there we have uh, found a spotty being pegmatite having 1.5% lithium oxide. There we will have the mining concentrator that we will increase from 1.5 to 6% lithium oxide uh, grade. And we will transport uh, the constant, sodium concentrate by truck from the mine site to Shibugamu City over 300 kilometers on, with uh, uh, two uh, trailers, uh, truck having uh, about 100 tons each. Uh, and then we will transfer to rail at Shibugamu and uh, transport by rail the concentrate to Shawinigan where we had just acquired an old uh, 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 pulp and paper mill that just closed about uh, two years ago. And we, uh, every year, why we, we uh, 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 have acquired this site is, uh, well, first it was on the way of the railroad coming from the north of uh, Quebec, from Shibugamo, so it was uh, uh, on the way of the railroad. But here you have everything uh, to operate a chemical plant. So sometimes people ask me, uh, what is the advantage of your, of, of your uh, project compared to a brine project in South America? Uh, on, a flu sheet, on a flu sheet, the conventional process to extract lithium from brine in South America, it looks simple, but don't forget you are three, 4,000 meter high in the mountain with nothing there to operate a chemical plant. So you have, here you have everything needed to operate a chemical plant. You already have the gas, uh, gas plug, you already have the electro, uh, uh, power plant, you have a, a city with uh, a lot of workers ready to, uh, that have lost their job in the spot pulp and paper mill, ready to work again, and you have existing building allow us to save about 20 millions on the capex of the, of the project. Uh, we have a lot of, this is the St. Maurice River, is a giant river with uh, very high quality of water, easy to uh, pro produce processed water with, uh, at very low cost. So it's a nice infrastructure. So now uh, that in, we, we are currently building a, our phase one plant here in these two areas, these two sections of the main building. Uh, it is the uh, 30, officially 38 million budget project for two years, 25 million for CapEx for the construction of the demo plant and 13 million for the OPEX over two years. So this is to uh, engage customer in advance with our project, uh, with our project, to uh, start training workers to confirm the technology cho uh, choices of the different uh, step of the process, confirm the supplier equipment performance, uh, and so on. So this uh, will significantly uh, help to de-risk the startup of the commercial plant, and we are currently uh, uh, refurbishing these two buildings here, 
to start to construct the uh, commercial uh, plant uh, next year. So basically, the uh, Nemaska business plan has two key advantages. One is on the mine side, uh, uh, and the second is on is the transformation advantage because of the electrochemical process. Uh, basically, on the mine side, if this is a cross section of the of the Nemaska Wabuchi deposit. Wabuchi means white mountain in the Cree native language. Because uh, spodumene pegmatite is a white granite uh, rock. So, as you can see here, the 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 Wabushi deposit is 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 the main dikes as between 30 and 85 meters wide by 1.3 kilometers long. So that allows us, and the grade is higher. So we know only one other spodumene deposit having a higher grade in Australia, which is the uh, only one in operation right right now, named Green Bushes. In Australia, we have so the second largest in terms of grade and uh, reserve, confirmed reserve, uh, the second largest deposit in, in the world. So, and the shape of the deposit, because of this huge main dike, allow us to produce the spodumene concentrate with a very low stripping ratio and very low dilution. Because a lot of spodumene deposits have very narrow dikes. And was, if you ask the operator to shovel the R, you ask them, you ask him to to take only the white spodumene pegmatite, but all the rocks are black and white because you you you, you cannot split your, the R with low dilution. So only with that you can go in bankruptcy. If you don't manage that properly, if you spodumene deposit is not of higher of uh, a grade, uh, a grade high enough and large dike, dike uh, enough large to, to properly separate the 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 waste from the valuable ore, then it can you, gives you a deep trouble and you won't be able to produce a good quality concentrate and to transform it into. So that's uh, very important, but the main. For the production of a, very, uh, of a good quality concentrate that you can extract properly, extract the lithium with high recovery uh, after. But the main uh, advantage of the Nemaska business plan is the electrochemical process. This electrochemical process allows us to to uh, directly produce lithium hydroxide using low-cost electric power instead of a chemical reagent producing technical grade lithium carbonate that needs to be repolished. So that's the the uh, the uh, main advantage of the Nemaska process is if you look at the conventional process uh, patented by uh, 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 um, Lithium uh, Corporation of America in 1954, this is a chemical process by opposition to the Nemaska process, which is an electrochemical process. So the conventional process, process is you <coughs> using soda ash. In both cases, you extract lithium from the spodumene using sulfuric acid and producing lithium sulfate as a precursor that you transform after that to obtain the, the, the lithium raw material. So, but the conventional process is using sodium carbonate to precipitate lithium carbonate because lithium carbonate is less soluble than sodium carbonate. So, but this process, you, you create so, uh, sodium sulfate, salt cake as a byproduct. So salt cake is a dehydrate mold. So you need to, at that time when this process has been invented, it was not a problem. You throw the salt cake solution byproduct in the river nearby the plant. There was no problem. But today you cannot do that anymore. So today you have to crystallize the salt cake you have to dry it, and if you want to reduce the cost of the, this dehydrate model uh, uh, compound, then you remelt it in its own water of hydration, you recrystallize it. So there's a lot, it's, it's quite a, a, a significant uh, chemical process, and uh, uh, salt cakes stick everywhere into the, uh, the compound, uh, the, 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 yes. 
into the into the, the different part of the uh, the crystallization process, and it has no value. And if you have salt cake byproduct today, you ask researcher, what can I do with that? So the idea always come back to electrolyze it. It is feasible, but you can hardly, some people doing it on a small scale commercially, but you can hardly compete with the chloralkali process, which is highly optimized to produce directly sodium hydroxide and uh, uh, chlorine and hydrochloric acid after that. So if it's a good idea to electrolyze salt cake to get rid of this byproduct, why not electrolyze directly the lithium sulfate? <coughs> so basically, that's the idea. It's not done. It's, it, has, it, has, it is not practiced yet. It's not because it's not feasible, but basically because if you go back five years ago, the lithium hydroxide market was so small, and the, 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 oh, there's only few players, and they build over the, the, the chemical process that they have built decades ago. And when they need to increase the capacity, it's so much easier for them to enlarge their chemical process than to uh, uh, engage and develop an electrochemical process. So basically, you, you, uh, you use hydroelectric power to split the lithium sulfate into lithium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. So you can see that as a, as a, it's an electromembrane process with the decomposition of water at the, uh, at the uh, electrode and forming hydroxide on the cathodic side and sulfuric acid on the anodic side. So, <clears throat> Uh, the advantage, basically, the advantage of the Nemesco lithium uh, 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 hydroxide uh, electrolysis is to directly produce high-purity lithium hydroxide because you need to, uh, the membrane uh, needs to be high-purity feed. So all of your production, like in the chloride calcium industry, is going to be a very, very high-purity. And the advantage is that compared to the conventional process, when you add the soda ash, even, even if you purify the lithium sulfate, sulfate, and even if you purchase the highest grade of, uh, of soda ash, which is a, has a high cost, you need to repolish your lithium carbonate because you, when you add the soda ash in your lithium sulfate solution, you add impurity. So from lithium sulfate to lithium, lithium hydroxide, you need to produce carbonate first to repolish your carbonate. After that, you need to reconvert your carbonate into hydroxide. So that's two different chemical processes with polishing in that. So that's why it's really an advantage to directly produce lithium hydroxide. Uh, and it's easy after that to produce lithium carbonate. Uh, because you can have customer that needs both hydroxide and carbonate for different reasons. So you just need to bubble CO2 into your lithium hydroxide solution and you will precipitate uh, lithium carbonate. So the advantage of the, of the, uh, of the process is uh, basically it's an electrochemical process. You can reuse that allows to reuse the sulfuric acid. So you dr uh, drastically reduce the, 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 the need for chemical reagent. Uh, you, um, and uh, you also, when you use hydroelectric power, then you also significantly reduce the greenhouse gas emission related to the production of lithium uh, compound, raw material. That's why we obtained 16 million uh, non-refundable subsidy from uh, both federal and provincial uh, government in Canada. Uh, to help us found our demonstration plan project. So, uh, and we are currently building this demonstration plan. As I mentioned to you, we are currently building this demonstration plan in these two areas, and we expect to start it in uh, January 7, 2017, and to produce over 500 tons equivalent lithium hydroxide monohydrate with this demonstration plan. We have signed with Johnson Batty Battery Material in agreement. Uh, they have uh, pay, uh, an upfront payment, 12 million Canadian upfront payment to complete the funding of this demonstration plan. And they have signed a offtake agreement for future, uh, for, the, to, for the production of the demo plant and future production 
of the commercial project that will enter into production in 2018. So that's it. Thank you for uh, your uh, for thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Any questions, Mike? Can you comment on the nanomaterials and the membrane material that you're going to use in yourself? Uh, yes, I can briefly comment. I would say that, uh, as you have seen on the picture, is uh, uh, there is um, the, there is uh, you, this kind of uh, electromembrane process or so membrane electrolysis use a, a um, titanium coated anode. So in that case, you, we, you need to use what you call DS, dimensionally stable anode, DSAO2, to evolve a oxygen instead. In the chloralkaline industry, you use DSACL2 anode. In our case, it's DSAO2 anode. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a similar composition than in the chloralkaline industry, but then not exactly the same. Ed? Ed, Ed right here. I'm just curious, what are you doing with the hydrogen? Because you're making a lot of hydrogen. What are we doing with the hydrogen? Yeah, the hydrogen gas. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, first step of the, of the, of the process uh, is to convert the alpha spodumene, 6% is oxide alpha spodumene uh, concentrate to beta spodumene that you need to heat the concentrate to 1050 degrees C. Then you can use the hydrogen as a, as a fuel for your kiln or your furnaces to heat and to convert your concentrate. Or you can also use it at different place in the plant, but from safety point of view, if you use only it at one place, it's easier, it's more simple from safety point of view to use it all in the in the, the, the kin, let's say, for the conversion. But you can use it also for your boiler, for your crystallizer, at different places, depending on the layout of your plant. Yes? Have you proven in the R&D that the flow sheet for the cell process, you know, the products you really want to get out, absolutely needs two membranes in that cell, or you could simplify it to a single membrane process? That's a good question. I cannot disclose. I'm sorry. Any other question? Okay. What are the key impurities that you need to watch out for in this process back then? One of the key impurity? Basically, it's quite similar to the Clara industry. Uh, silica, uh, calcium, because uh, the, uh, the combination of both uh, create uh, calcium uh, silicate or mag magnesium calcium silicate in your membrane. So when they meet uh, silica and silicon in calcium or, in, or magnesium, when they, when they meet together into the membrane, they, pre they form precipitate and they, that you, if you have some PPM calcium, uh, silicon, silicon, it's not so bad. If you have some PPM calcium, it's not so bad. But uh, see, if you have both, uh, that's not a good thing. So you, have, you need to be very good on the purification. And it's, it's a problematic, very, very similar to the chloralkali industry. Thank you. Thank you very much.